Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered together on the 16th of the fifth month, if I remember correctly, which is also the 30th of July on the Gregorian calendar. And we are on chapter two of Book of Gad the Seer. Thank you, Earl. He was just confirming that I was on. So we're on book two, or sorry, chapter two of Gad the Seer. We're going to go ahead and read through it, and then um, I'll do a little bit of commentary here and there. What I really wanted to do, though, is share, now that we have an idea of who these things are talking about, I wanted to share some of the other scriptures that go along with it that you can see that you might not have noticed before. But without further ado, we'll get right into it. <clears throat> it says, after these true things... I had an ill breathed vision saying, set your face eastward, northward, southward, and westward, and whistle with your mouth as a bird whistles to its chicks, and say four corners of the earth, hearken to the word of Yahuwah. Thus said Yahuwah, who sits and dwells over the cherubs, or cherubim, give, give, give. Take out, take out, take out my seed that I have sown in you. For the time of the seed has come. All right, you remember the, it's repeated for emphasis, but you have the giving of the seed and the taking out of the seed, which is his word. And for the time of the word has come. The, you know the seed is the word because he gives that parable in the beginning. And he said, or he gives the parable when he was in the flesh. And he says, when they ask him the meaning of it, he says, don't you know this parable? It's the parable of parables. The seed is the word. And you can take that meaning all the way back to the creation account. Most clearly seen in Yobelim or Jubilees chapter two. When you line up the letters of the Aleph Bet with the works of creation, you get to Yod. The working hand, which is the tenth letter, which lines up with the seed and all sprouting things. So the seed is the word. The word is the covenant that he gave to Abraham on down to the Torah, given to the children, which was the work of his hand. The molding of the clay vessels, if you will, into profitable use for him. So just to tie in different things there, right? For yet a little while, I shall collect my seed on the threshing floor. When you think about how seed is collected in the different varieties, the threshing and the things that go on, this is the life and development of the fruits in the body of a man, right? And there's different ways that each one are produced, just like there's different fruit trees or different ways that the different fruits are, are grown. And each one in its development, growth and maturation, how the how it's fermented or produced <clears throat> it, either through the ruach or germination in some other manner it's to teach you a reasonable mind the different ways that you can get men to be fruitful in life i've never done that study but someone can it's all in the word these are just to encourage you to look at these things in a different way it says and the threshing floor will be kodesh or set apart and an impure seed will not be found in it. For before those days, my seed was mixed with lentil and barley and spelt beans and gourd. And in the end of days, the sower shall be true and the seed shall be true. And from the seed, all the land will be Baruch or blessed. And you remember it was the end of days by the time our Mashiach came and he was the sower, sowing the word, right? And then the enemy came and sowed the tares. But his word was true, and all the seed, or those that were fruitful, made the land prosperous because of it. Be joyful and glad, remnant of Yahuda, and rejected of Yisrael, for deliverance is with Yahuwah. If you recall, Yahuda means the one who confesses, acknowledges, and praises Yahuwah. And it's not the Yahudi who circumcised in the flesh, but the one who circumcised in the heart, who's the true Yahudi, right? 
And then the rejected of Yisrael is the remnant, those that are cast out from the main body because they're not like them, right? They're the ones that strive with men in hell and overcome. It says, as you shall be a curse and blasphemy to all the families of the earth, so shall you be a Baraka, blessing forever and ever. Our Mashiach said, as I am, so you shall be in the world. And everyone perfected shall be as their master. They were made martyrs at that time, if you recall. At that time, no cursed or unset apart people would be found among you. For everyone will join you in the covenant, in the Torah, testimonies, statutes, and ordinances. Meaning everyone's going to be obedient to the common law. And that's that mountain mentioned in Daniel's vision, or in the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. That stone that smashes the feet of the statue that grows into a mountain that is the kingdom of our creator made during the reign of these kingdoms that will smash the idolatry and rise up to not yield its sovereignty to another. Okay. When he comes, there's the wicked would be put away. There'll be ashes under our feet. This is what he, the, the things that are being spoken of here. And everyone's going to keep the common law or the Torah. And you and they shall have one L, one covenant, one Torah or law, one language, for all shall speak in the Yahudith language. Oh, it originally said the language of the Jews, right? And if you look in the common scriptures, there's two places that mention the language of the Jews like that. And if you look at the Hebrew, it says Yahudith, just like the, the Judith. Her name is Yahudith. And it's the language that confesses, acknowledges, and praises Yahuwah, right? And that is the language of creation or what they call Hebrew, the Kodesh language. Happy are you, Yisrael, who is like unto you, a people delivered by Yahuwah, for he shall go before you to fight your wars with your enemies. And that's true. You go through it, and he does. He's a man of battle alone, and we should trust in him to, to accomplish these things and not ourselves. Woe to you, Edom! that sits in the land of Katim in the north of the sea. Edom being equated to Catholicism, okay, or the Roman assembly that went apostate, that sits in the land of the Katim, which is unequivocally Rome. When you look in the apocryphal writings, and the things that are in the common scriptures or were in the Apocrypha and removed, you find that the Ketim is mixed with Greece or Macedonia. And that's one of the original errors, the, the scribal errors that were put in to throw things off, whether, whether it was done by a man on purpose or through translation issues or whatever. It's Satan who's the responsible party for all error. And perverting the truth is his heart's desire. You find out here, <clears throat> you find out in the Dead Sea Scrolls unequivocally that the Ketim is Rome. And it's also proven in the writings of Josephus. These are three different writings that came down in different ways that all say the same thing because it has the same author. That was the point. And it's the thing you can get, like with the, the differences between the two Ruachoth or the two spirits, the, whether the Ruach of our father or the spirit of the, the devil, if you will. There's so much information throughout the entirety of the writings in the canonical scriptures, in the apocryphal writings, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the hidden writings of the Old and New Covenant. You go back to Hanok, you go to the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, you go to the Shepherd of Hermas, or the Apostolic Constitutions, and you get one voice. It all talks about the same thing, and that's how you can know it's true. No, no man can fake that, right? <clears throat> but right here, this is a great 
connection Edom being the land of the Katim at the north of the Mediterranean or the north of the sea. Okay. For it, and you can see as we read, you'll know who it's speaking of. We're going to get into that in just a minute. It says, for your destroyers will emerge from a terrible nation, not leaving you a remnant. It was foreshadowed with the destruction of pagan Rome, but it's going to culminate with the, their destruction later on. <clears throat> for you have said, on high is my seat, and I have knowledge of the L of mighty ones. For Yahuwah chose me instead of his set-apart people, for he loathed them. And his former people, despised and rejected, did not know Yahuwah or his image. Truly, we are wise and clever. We know Yahuwah and his law. We know his image and his presence. Therefore, and this is what Rome says, right? The papacy, the Catholicism. Therefore, <clears throat> thus said Yahuwah, because you rose so high to talk about the El of Elohim, know that you shall perish in your cleverness. For why would you put confidence in man in whose nostrils is his breath, which came up in a night and like a day shadow that passes by, setting him to sit beside Elohim? For it is not you whom I knew formerly, and where is the bill of divorce for my or of my people, that you would or that you said would be a prey? Show it to me. Your corpses will fall among my people. Jealous Yahuwah, come out, come out of your place and thrash Edom, consume them. Come to Zephyrath, which is France. Come to Sepharad, which is Spain. Come to Ashkenaz, which is where the, you know, Ashkenazis, right? You, you know where that was at, the Karzai area of the middle of Europe, okay? Right by the Black Sea there. Come to Garmania, Germany, the heart of where his people in evil were doing, right? In particular, where my family came from and left when Prussia and Germany were fighting, and Prussia annexed the, Han the kingdom of Hanover. It was when my uh, forefather came to America, 1864 or 1867. But France, Spain, Ashkenazi, Germany, they shall come and shall fall in the innermost pit, in destruction and in the shadow of death. For your mouth will fail you, and no one will help you. The little mouth speaking great things, if you recall from Daniel. <clears throat> and at the end of days, Mikael, the great prince, shall stand up in war like a whirlwind against Samael, the prince of the world, to put him under his feet. Samael means the poison of El. It's another title for Satan. This is also alluded to in Daniel chapter 12, I believe. It says, in the wind of Yahuwah, and it shall be eaten up, for Yahuwah has spoken it. At the end of days, the robbed will overcome the robber. Like those being plundered with endless unlawful taxes <clears throat> and having your goods and houses and things that are not supposed to be plundered taken from you. The robbers will overcome the robber, and the weak, the strong, truly and in righteousness your l is your deliverer yisrael with him you will be delivered for he is a merciful elohim he will not abandon you for you shall keep on doing all that i commanded you in the torah of moshe my servant which really is the culmination of what's all throughout if you read the apostolic constitutions the commandments for general commandments, the commandments for men, the commandments for women. This is what he wants you to do. So yeah, thank you for that. If you give me just one moment, I want to bring up something else. Real All right. So 
Now, with what we have in mind, with what Edom represents in a ruachni or spiritual capacity, I want to bring your attention to some of the other scriptures that talk about it real quick. So one of them is right here in Psalm 137. And th there's distinctions. There's the, there's Zion, and then there's the daughter or daughters of Zion, excuse me. There is Babylon, and then there's the daughter of Babylon, or the daughters of mystery Babylon, right? So there's distinctions in scripture. There's things mentioned, and it's not random. It's not willy-nilly. They are significant and for a purpose. Everything is for a purpose. The reason why our Mashiach rode in on a donkey and a colt so the female donkey and its its child is because our Mashiach, the truth, came into the world to Yarushalayim through the original children that came from the original Yarushalayim and then the, the one that came from it after the destruction of Babylon. In the same way, right here, you're going to see the daughter of Zion or the daughter of Babylon mentioned because it's not Babylon itself, but the mystery religions the Eleusian mysteries spread out. And if you recall, we talked about it before, but when the Persians took over the reign from Babylon, the seat of the mystery religions was transferred from Babylon to Turkey at the place called Pergamos. And it was the king of Pergamos who was the Pontifus Maximus or priest kings that had the Moloch worship that was condemned in scripture king worship that was picked up by the caesars with julius when he was bequeathed the uh kingdom of pergamos and its mystery religion priesthood and he took it and that's why rome is literally the daughter of babylon they adopted all the paganism and brought it in and um if you're not familiar with how they worked, when you look at the anti mashiach for Dummies videos, it gives you a little bit into the life of how Rome functioned. Their family heads were their fathers. The fathers were priests. The priests would go do, they would, they would go into the catacombs and speak with demons. They called it speaking with their dead ancestors, but there's no such thing. It's, it's familiar spirits is demoned. Okay, they would communicate with demons and get their marching orders for what to do. And that's how they did these things. Um, when they had their pagan rituals, it was casting witchcraft spells like the Invocatia. It was a ritual to use magic to entice the mighty one of another nation to become theirs by, by giving it better gifts. And then that would allow them to overcome those people. But they would adopt the religion, which is what they did with Yahudism, which is the whole thing of why they adopted the Nicolaitism beliefs, which is what was exposed in Revelation. So you can start seeing the picture there, right? But um, this is how it was foretold beforehand in the life of Edom, born in the womb with Yaakov, but rising up against his brother, plundering his family's goods, uh, all the evils that he did, right? But the, re the reward for it is he's going to be like the boar that rushes into the spear that kills him. So here we go. <clears throat> it says, by rivers of Babylon, there we did sit. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. On willows in the midst we hung our harps. And that's a picture in a very literal sense of Selah as Eric Bissell puts it, to stop and think about it, a suspension in the music, a pause, right? For there our captors asked us the words of a song, and our spoilers joy. Sing ye to us song of the song of Zion. How do we sing the song of Yahuwah on the land of strangers, or on the land of a stranger? If I forget you, Yarushalayim, my right hand forget. My tongue does cleave to my palate if I do not remember you. If I do not exalt 
Yarushalayim above my chief joy. And this would be for us, the Shemaim Yarushalayim. If we don't hold that above any joy in this world, we'll capitulate to do what Catholicism you know, tells you, the convert or die, right? If I do not exalt you, Yarushalayim above my chief joy, remember Yahuwah for the sons of Edom. The day of Yarushalayim, those saying raise, raise to its foundation. O daughter of Babylon, destroyed one, or you who are to be destroyed, the happiness of him who repays to you your deed that you have done to us, the happiness of him who does seize and has dashed your sucklings or your children on the rock. Now that can seem like it's a, an atrocious thing to think about. But both Edom in that day and Catholicism even to this day will do such a thing literally. Um, not to get into it too much, but you can look up the congressional record for our country and the oath of the Jesuit order is in that. And one of the things they swear to do is to dash infants against the, a rock to, to kill them in a literal sense. And we, in a literal spiritual sense, are to dash the children of Babylon against the rock of truth and so have them broken and, and repent. And it's to our happiness if we are to do such a thing. So we're encouraged to take and smash the idols to, to leave nothing in kindness you speak the truth but you share what's true to those who are not walking right in the capacity that they can take it first for whatever open sins they're committing right idolatry would be a huge one if you know someone's an adulterer they have to repent of that before you tell them about the secret things of the kingdom right the open evil if they're freely loose with the truth you got to repent from being a liar. If they're cowardly and capitulate to things through fear, that has to be overcome before you give them the, the meat. They got to get the milk and, and get out of being the child in belief. I'm sure that makes sense to you, right? All right, so there, this one's a great one right here. That was Psalm 137. There's many more that do this very thing. I want to find one more for you real quick. So if you just give me a moment, I'm going to pause and we'll look it up real quick. All right. The, the next section right here I want to share with you is just Obed-Yahu, or what they call Obadiah, which is the servant of Yahuwah, right? Obed is to serve, where we get in English the word obey, obedience, obedient, right? And then Yahu is the short form of our creator's name, of course. Right here, this is a very, very open condemnation. And now, if you're familiar with Edom being Babylon, being Roman Catholicism specifically, and Edom was born in the womb with Yaakov, the assembly at Rome was built with the assemblies all throughout the world by the emissaries. It was built up by them. It's enumerated. They had anointed the first two overseers. Shaul had anointed Linus, who came from Britain. Of the, he lived in the palace of the Brits, his Cardoc's son, Gladys, or Claudia, as she was named, is in scripture, and so is Linus. They're mentioned. But he was anointed by Shaul to be the first overseer of the Roman assembly. And he was martyred. Kepha was brought there preaching, eventually came, and in around 63 AD, he was martyred as well. But before he did, he anointed Clement. Hermas was also a pastor at Rome. So they had assemblies there that were walking right and were righteous. It was by, <clears throat> I believe, the seventh overseer of the Roman assembly because they were being martyred, right? But uh, Sixtus the first was, uh, I believe, the one that Polycarp would have went to, and they were contesting about why they're keeping it on the, the the first day of the week and keeping 
the Pesach on the wrong day because Polycarp was keeping it the way they handed down from the emissaries, Yahukinon specifically, and Rome was doing differently. But they both went away peaceably because they were doing what was enjoined from their patriarchs and didn't want to deviate. However, it was perversion that had already started by that point. And when you get to the 44th bishop or overseer of Rome, that would have been Sixtus III, whom was foretold in Revelation and brought in the abomination of desolation, which is the image of the false mighty one in the temple of Elohim that they sacrificed the pig on, which is the heart of man. Okay. I'm sorry, give me one moment, please. So, um, I forgot my train of thought on that, but to get back on track here, we'll see that, oh yeah, Edom was born in the womb with Yaakov, but then rose up against him, right? And in the same way, the Roman assembly was born with all the assemblies, or the Yaakov, the ones that had to return at their hill, but they rose up against and persecuted their brother, hated him from the heart, plundered their father's goods. The same exact thing you see Edom doing in Genesis and Yobelim. And these are why the foretellers say the things they do about them, including here. <clears throat> Rome is known for the eagle, for being on high, and for the things we just read. And you'll, you'll see these illusions more clearly as we go through this, ob willing. But it says, thus said Yahuwah, or thus said the master Yahuwah to Edom, a report we have heard from Yahuwah. And an ambassador among nations was sent. Rise, yea, let us rise against her for battle. And that battle is mentioned by Yirmiyahu in great detail. <clears throat> We're not going to get into that one, but if you look up Edom or Babylon, throughout, just do a word search today, I encourage you, and find out the different places it mentions that, and read, and you'll you'll see more and more it's talking about Catholicism specifically when it's the daughter of Babylon and Edom being put together. This is rise and let us go against her for battle. Lo, or behold, little I have made you among nations and the Vatican's just little city state. Despised are you exceedingly. The pride of your heart has lifted you up dweller in the cleft of the rock or clefts of the rock a high place is his habitation he is saying in his heart who does bring me down to earth if you do go up high as an eagle and if between stars you do set your nest from thence i will bring you down an affirmation of yahuwah if thieves have come into you if spoilers of the night, how has you or how have you been cut off? Do they not steal your sufficiency? Now, this one reads a little different than the other. Um, in the other version that I have, it says, if you were to be plundered, would, wouldn't they leave you some, you know, would they, would they take what you had? And if you were to have gatherings come, wouldn't they leave the gleanings, right? But they don't. And if you think about the opulence and theft of Catholicism, they pillage the everyone, they have all that treasure and, and disgusting wealth while they impoverish those that, that are under their care. Right. If gatherers have come into thee, do they not leave gleanings? How hath Esau been searched out? Float out have his hidden things. Unto the border sent thee have all thine allies. Forgotten you, prevailed over you, have your friends. Your bread they make a snare under you. There is no comprehension in him. Is it not in that day an affirmation of Yahuwah that I have destroyed the wise out of Edom and comprehension out of the Mount of Esau? And broken down have been your mighty ones, O Taman, so that every one of the Mount of Esau is caught off. For slaughter, for violence to your brother Yaakov, cover you does shame. 
or shame does cover you, and you have been cut off to the age. In the day of your standing over against, in the day of strangers taking captive his force, and foreigners having entered his gates, and for Yarushalayim have cast a lot, even though you are as one of them. And if you're not familiar, read the War of the Yahudim, and you'll get a first-hand account of the interactions of what Edom and Yahuda were doing during the time when Rome was coming in to conquer, right? They were working together. There was angst and fight, infighting. But um, if you keep that in mind with what's going on today, it helps to make more sense of things. That's why we have Catholics intermixed throughout people and they think that they're all of the same belief when it's diametrically opposite. Catholicism is Satan's baby in this, it's, it's his religion in this world. It's a mockery of the truth. But they get Christians or people who are supposed to be believers of scripture to agree that they're brethren together, like Edom and Yaakov, but it's really perverted, okay? <clears throat> but it says, and you do not look on the day of your brother, on the day of his alienation, nor do you rejoice over the sons of Yahuda in the day of their destruction, nor make great your mouth in the day of distress, nor come into a gate of my people in a day of their calamity, nor look even you on the misfortune in the day of its calamity, nor send forth against its force in the day of its calamity, nor stand by the breach to cut off its escape, nor deliver up its remnant in the day of distress. For near is the day of Yahuwah on all the nations. As you have done, it is done to you. Your deed does turn back on your own head. And this is why Edom is going to be cut off without remnant or survivor. Because that's their policy to go in and convert or die, right? If at all possible, they remove any anything of a remnant of disagreement with them. It says, for as you have drunk on my set-apart mount, drink do all the nations continually. And they have drunk and have swallowed, and they have been as they have not been. And in Mount Zion there is an escape, and it has been set apart, and the house of Yaakob have possessed their possessions. Now, Zion means the fruitful, the, the, the sprouting branch in the wilderness, if you will, or the, the, the fruitful thing in the desert that sprouts out. Right When that's made, set apart, there's an escape for them, right? And when it's Kadosh, and the house of Yaakov have possessed their possessions, okay? Meaning they take hold of what is theirs. And Yaakov means those who have what's coming at the heel of what they're doing. It's immediate reciprocity, if you will. Kefe explains it the best way that... Um, those that are not malicious sinners suffer more expediently in this life for the things that they do. Like Yaakov, he didn't get away. He was, if you read about his account of his witness of himself to his mother, he never had an evil intention or thought that he dwelt on for any man. He always thought for their benefit or good, even his brother. So because he was not malicious in his thinking, he was corrected more expediently for the things he did wrong in this life. And you can see it in his life. Okay. That's the kind of behavior we have to be. His children were the same way. The ones that did evil suffered for it, but they repented and were brought back. However, it played out in the children, the things that they did in a larger scale as well. <clears throat> but let's continue real quick. It says, for as you have drunk on my set-apart mount, drink do all the nations continually, 
and they have drunk and have swallowed, and they have been as they have not been. And in Mount Zion there is an escape, and it has been set apart, and the house of Jacob have possessed their possessions. And the house of Jacob has been a fire, and the house of Yahusuf a flame, which Jacob stands for Yahuda here, because Yahuda is the one that was corrected for the things they were doing wrong. Yahusuf was cast off and given the bill of divorce, if you recall. They were no longer in covenant with their maker so that he wouldn't wipe them out completely for what they're doing. But they were fruitful. However, when they were doing evil, they were suffering. But he did with them what he said. <clears throat> There's a book called Yahuda's Scepter and Yahusuf's Birthright, or Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. It was written in 1917, and it does a very good job. There's some that do better jobs, but it's a very clean cut and does a great job of showing the, the scepter covenant promises given to the tribe of Yahuda that culminated in the monarchy of Britain, but really it's the monarchs of the world. And then Yahusuf, the fruitful borough, or the one that was given the, the, the covenant promises of a multiplicity of children, of being the battle axe and hammer and the, and the sledging, the threshing sledge of the Almighty that would crush nations and, and retaliate for what they did to his children. And literally throughout history, you can see that very thing happening. They rose up to Ephraim and Manasseh, or the, the, the northern kingdom, if you will, to destroy every enemy that rose up against his children, even to today, although it's been perverted now, too. But real quick, for an example, just so you can get it, Assyria captured the northern kingdom within 100 years, though, the Scythians or Scythians in bands of roving mercenary tribes had whittled the Assyrians down to practically nothing. And they were one of the main forces that were hired or given by the Babylonians to sack the Assyrians when they took over. They helped break them down as mercenaries. And then they did the same thing against Babylon with the Persians. I don't know about them doing anything to the Persians, but they also were the ones as the Germans that came in, the hordes that sacked pagan Rome. And so it's been happening throughout history like that. And you can see all these things in his word actually fulfilled in the body of his children and those sojourning with them because there was no distinction made by our creator. You are called by the tribe that you sojourn with. If that makes sense to you, it's the same thing that he mentions all the way back from the time of the Exodus. You had the children and then the mixed multitude, and you were to regard the stranger as the native born, and they were to be called by the tribe that they sojourned amongst. So it's all part of the Torah founded by then and carried on. You can see it beforehand, even in the life of Abraham, where it wasn't just Abraham himself, but everyone that dwelled with him, every servant in the house was circumcised and kept the feasts. They are part of the eternal covenant, right? Um, and then you can see it carried on later on. So to get back on point here, you can see this is now talking about when he returns and how Yaakov or Yahuda is a fire and Yahusuf is a flame. This is the kingdom of Yahuda and the kingdom of Yisrael, okay? Or the remnants thereof, if you will. And the house of Esau for stubble and they have burned among them and they have consumed them and there is not a remnant to the house of Esau for Yahuwah has spoken and they have possessed the south with the mount of Esau and the low country with the Philistines and they have possessed the field of Ephraim and the field of Samaria and Benjamin with Gilead or Gilead. In the five books of the Maccabees, they translated that as Gilead or Gilead, right? And the removed of this force of the sons of Yisrael, that 
the Canaanim unto Zephyrat, which is France, and the removed of Yarushalayim, that with the Sephirod, which is Spain, or the Sephardic Yahudim, right? They possess the cities of the south, and gone up, have deliverers on Mount Zion, to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom has been to Yahuwah. So I apologize, it reads a little weird in this particular translation. It's, uh, I believe this is Young's literal, but you're not, we're not really used to the old English, and they keep the sentence structure the same as it is, which puts some of our words and verbs differently than how we normally read in English. The reason why that is is because we started doing things backwards. It went from right to left, and now it's left to right. Another connection or interesting thing there is le'eg. Le'eg is the strange lip in Hebrew, but in Germanic it's gale, and Gaelic is what they were speaking to them that they couldn't get right. But it can it. The Germanic and the Gaelic are both Hebrew languages, but they switched and they changed differently based on where they went. When they went to the east first, they lost the use of the language with suffixes and prefixes, and the words locked in certain ways with what they call the Bagad Kephath letters, the letters that normally change in the, the natural function of Hebrew. And then they had what they called the Germanic sound shift, the hot, the first germanic sound shift which was universal to everyone that spoke the languages and then there was a high german sound shift about a thousand years later when the palestinian yahudim after the babylonian captivity were exiled and went into germany everywhere they went they caused the high german sound shift which then the germans there spoke high german and the jews or yahudim spoke yiddish which was high german but it was broken Hebrew. The only difference between High German and Yiddish is the, the letters that they use. The Germans used the runic letters in the Latin that they had adopted, and the Yahudim still had the Babylonian Chaldean flame letters that they used. But the language was identical, and you can look that up. <clears throat> um, a lot of people want to say that they're not legitimately Yahudim because they spoke German, but it, they spoke the high German because they caused that sound shift. And that was known and documented in a doctrinal dissertation by Terry Bloodgett, Dr. Terry Bloodgett, who got his doctorate in German, in, in languages, Germanic and, and Hebrew, for his dissertation, which is called The Phonological Similarities of the Germanic and Hebrew Languages. He wrote that in 1981, and he talks about all the things I just mentioned in great detail. So, I have that too. I'll share it with you guys if you're interested, but it's really, if you like language, if you like seeing how the Hebrew came from or came and became English, it's great, but there's a lot of technical things there. If you're not familiar with the Hebrew, it might be a little difficult, but if you think about how English works, it, a lot of it still functions the same way. We just don't know why we have the rules that we do. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I found it very fascinating, even though I was not very familiar with German anymore. I took it in high school. I was able to see the connections from Hebrew to German to English with the, the way the language changed the entire way, though, and I thought it was amazing. But it was something that was near and dear to my heart. Excuse me. Just give me one moment, and I have one more thing I'd like to share. All right, and then this is the last section I think we'll be able to read through before we're going to call it for the Shabbat. But I do want to mention there's many other references of what's going to happen at this time with this people, what they're allowed to do, all the things involved. Um, it's really there's nothing that's happened without it being first shown to his foretellers, like he said. Um, second Baruch has a parable of the cedars and the vine and the waters. And when the vine and waters return, they wipe out the forest of cedars and the last tree that's left is rebuked and then killed. And that's the anti-Mashiach. In 4th Ezra, the last beast of Daniel's vision 
that was fearsome and not distinct is given a fuller form as a three-headed eagle. And you get to see everything that would happen with Rome from the Caesars on until our times. The things that happen are literally all over the place. And if you can put them together, you read it, you'll learn the future. You'll be able to tell others what will happen with certainty because this is all true. And right here, you can see this is just one more source where there is foretelling about the things that would be and how <clears throat> it ties together with that. This is from the ancient history of Caledonia. And if you're not familiar, it is a family history of a branch of the Hebrews that had split off from the main group that was in Egypt or Mitzrayim that hadn't mixed with the Egyptians. They hadn't sinned. And when the Pharaoh had wanted to put their children into uh, subjection and then murder them, this remnant left. They founded Troy, then they left from there, went to Crete, went from Crete to Sicily, Sicily to Gaul, and eventually to Montrose in what we call Scotland, where they were known as the Grapine Mountain Savages before they called themselves the Caledonians, after getting the belief in our Mashiach by Kadoshi Chaldean. That's a lot for you, but generally why they have that name. And it's why Chaldonians or Chaldean is the name of Babylon or the Chasdeem in scripture because Rome hates these people above all. The McDonald's, the Blights, the McLaurins, the Highlanders of Scotland were a thorn in their side for well over a thousand years. And it wasn't until they perverted them through Catholicism and mixture that they were able to overcome their kingdom. But right here is a, a great condemnation and connection expose for those things uh, that we just read as well okay mm -hmm. it says the foretelling of kadoshi or saint set apart one mac isaac upon his deathbed at calendar calling his son kadoshi mac isaac the second he said son take unto you your pen and write that this yahuwah has shown unto me for it lies heavy at my heart that I neglected the words of Kadoshi Chaldean, who died at Dunkeld. But Yahuwah has brought it back to my memory by a vision, saying, Beware of the man-made priest, who shall come in as a wolf, not, not by the door, but shall come from afar upon you forcing himself upon you by the claim of unrighteousness and selling the word of Elohim for gain. Unrighteous decrees shall pass from his lips and he shall pretend to cleanse others while he lies in the mire himself. He shall speak fair words to kings while he puts the Kodeshim to shame and even to persecution and death. But fear not, when that comes on the assembly, as it is only a trial of your amuna or belief, trustworthiness, steadfast fidelity, that's all what amuna actually means. Stand you steadfast, for Yahuwah shall be your deliverer. By falsehood, guile, and fraud, they will crown kings. And woe be to Caldonia when the seed of my sister comes to the throne for few shall be their days of rain and bloody shall be their winding sheet they shall drink of the abominations and idolatry of the scarlet woman they shall lie as wolves waiting and thirsting for the blood of the set apart ones but i say fear not prosperous or happy is he who shall endure to the end for the crown of esteem shall be his and you remember that's enduring patiently in love. It says, this is believed to refer to Mary MacDonald, sister of the Kadoshi, who came back from the Romans with the steward of the camp, the first founder of the Stuart line or family of Butte. And the MacDonalds were from the line of Zara of Yahuda, and they were the royal family, the kings of the Caledonians, if you will. 
the Stuarts was a branch of that family that was later the monarchs over the land there and the monarch over Great Britain. If you recall, it was James Stuart, who was the first of England, the sixth of Scotland, but that would have been Caledonia here. And it was woe to them when the seed of her sister came to the throne. If you remember what the Stuarts were doing and what the, the monarchs of Europe were doing during this time, uh, they were actually working for Catholicism in the high church party was kicking out or wiping out real believers and causing them to flee. It's what caused the, the women fleeing to the wilderness of America to begin with. Okay. It says, to prove this foretelling, there shall arise a mighty champion of the assembly, who shall appear even as a champion at arms, and shall be betrayed like our deliverer, for they will sell the righteous man for gain. And that's supposed to be Sir William Wallace. If you look him up, he was actually betrayed by his servant and sold into captivity and then killed. The time shall be so troublesome that a McDonald shall weep over the McLaurin's or a McLaurin's grave while there is none to comfort him. The McDonald's of the royal line of Yahuda, the McLaurin's are of Louis or the, the Cohen line. There shall be great tribulation in the land for the scarlet clad woman shall dress herself as a bride preparing herself for her bridegroom and with her smiles and guile she shall betray many even so far that the one son shall betray the other the father the son and the mother the daughter the forerunner of this foretelling shall be the falling of the king from his horse and when there shall be none to fill his seat and that was supposed to be Alexander the third, who was assassinated by being pulled off of his horse, and there was no one to succeed him to the reign. It says the chiefs shall turn so treacherous to their clans that they will even sell them to their enemies and banish them from their own country. But Yahuwah will still be with you, although it will be only in the dark that you dare worship him. Even so, much shall you be persecuted and pursued from cave to cave, like as the eagle pursues his prey. Right? The Grams shall turn traitors to the McDonald's, and the McKays shall deny them. Even treachery, robbery, and fraud shall be their principles. There shall arise another king in another kingdom who shall from his lust and abominations form a religion and call it righteous he shall deceive thousands until it is established and shall sting caldonia three different times but yahuwah will yet deliver you this foretelling this is my own note the other two were notes from in the book itself when it was translated i put this one in myself it was not there. <clears throat> I also put in the information that William Wallace was betrayed by his servant because I looked it up when it, it had mentioned that I had, I didn't know. But it says, this foretells of King Henry VIII and the Anglican Church, which sadly was a result of Catholicism, the Scarlet Woman, and her infiltration into what became known as the High Church Party. And if you want absolute evidence for that, you can read through the um, the history and information that is in Albert Close's Divine Program of the World's History, which is a book about, conveniently enough, the Daniel and its fulfillments and things like that. But it says, this foretelling shall be proved when a woman shall arise from the dead and shall bear two sons of the true seed of King Kenneth of Fief, and they shall both be preachers of the good news. This proves the cloud of Elohim's wrath is passed over the assembly for the time. As the foretelling was fulfilled at the births of Ralph and Ebenezer Ernskine, 
they were both Ebenezer was the elder Ralph was the younger their mother had died and I looked up the story the uh, coroner tried to take the wedding ring off her finger by cutting her finger off and as soon as he put the knife to the finger she sat up got up and walked out he passed out and then she went home after she had risen from the dead like that she had had her two sons and they were both eminent preachers during the the 1700s the times of the reformation and they helped found the uh free scottish church right the the covenanters of scotland were a part of that thing that they were doing it was separate from the high church party and anglican in it uh assembly if you will but that's when i looked up their life history and i looked up their sermons and I, they have their their books on there and they're pretty amazing if you ever i can share those with you if you ever want to take the time to read them very beneficial this is the chiefs will annihilate the country by being false unto their clans and shall disperse them to a far foreign land but y'all who shall be with them and shall make them a nation strong and like the Israel shall return them to their native land and shall deliver the country from the deceiver. And my grandpa that adopted my mother is a, a Donaldson, right? So this is direct family history for us. My grandmother, my mom's mother, her, her father's father was a Blythe, which is the McLaurins, right? But a lot of people will find out that they're related <laughs> to these different families the mackintoshes the kennedys the collins like john todd who was a collins is from the caledonian history sadly by the time he was alive he had known them to be in generational witchcraft and the black nobility of the illuminati so that's what satan wants to do take the precious things of our creator and corrupt them This is the ministers of the good news shall turn so slothful that they cannot carry the word of Elohim from their breakfast table to the set apart place. To prove this foretelling, the streams of Glen Gyle shall wash the streets of Grey Dog's town and shall turn over the causeway blocks which the current or with the current of the stream. Then the son got wroth with the set apart one, saying, Father, you are beside yourself seeing that the Glen Gyle is at the west of Loch Katrine, and such a town as you are speaking of, no one has ever heard of. Yet the old Kadoshi in wrath rose up to his elbow and said, There shall be such a town, and the Greyhound's hunt shall be given to one of the true sons of Kadoshi Lawrence. This foretelling shall be fulfilled. The set-apart one spoke no more to his son in foretelling, he died and was buried at Calendar at the clear riverside. And then later on in the history, there's actually the beginnings of the fulfillment of those foretellings that happened. And I explained the later ones that were going on. That last one with the ministers being so slothful, not bringing the good news to the table is what we are even living through today. Part of the Counter-Reformation's second efforts with ecumenical movement after vatican council two but right here it says at this time the foretelling of kadoshi mcisaac was beginning to be fulfilled where he speaks of a man-made religion contrary to the will of elohim neither believing in immersion nor in yahuwah's supper according to the rules of the new covenant because they believed in trans Figuration, right, where they can turn the wafer and bread into the literal body and blood and consume them, which is contrary to what he said. But placing mortal man the head and ruler, whereas they should have acknowledged the supremacy of Elohim. The Romans, when they saw that they were to be totally overwhelmed by Nazarene, and therefore made a form of exianity or christianity to suit themselves this had been about 
It says 666 years after the birth of our Baruch Mashiach, right? But I went ahead and put 432 AD because that's literally the year that Sixtus III was ordained and set as the overseer of the Roman assembly as the 44th bishop. But it says this text was intentionally tampered with by the priest. If you read the introductions to this book, the man that the McLaurin who came across the, the scrolls and sheepskin writings and bought it from the Yahudi um, in the shop at Petticott Lane in London. He tried to get it translated from different people and they wouldn't touch it, but eventually a Roman, an Irish Roman Catholic priest translated it for him. So when it mentions the switching of the Sabbath to the first day of the week, that the sons of Louis wore long black robes and like right here where it was 666 years after instead of a man sixtus the third you can see that's perversion and error to hide the truth but to continue here it says this text was intentionally tampered with by the priest who translated it to hide the truth sixtus the third aka 666 started the decrees or state, yeah, you know, started the decrees against the truth and persecuted the believers in 432 AD with the laws that he had made and they compiled in one of the Theodosian codexes. And that was 432. By 480 AD, you had his laws that were established at that time actually being enforced by the sword of Rome with the Edict of Thessalon Thessalonica where they had to actually do what he said believe the trinity keep the mass do the do the uh, bread and wafer keep the easter and the lent forego the traditional feasts and ways or they were going to be killed Seven thousand refused to capitulate and that next year seven thousand were wiped out it was the largest massacre at the time and if you try to look it up like it mentions in those videos they give you some very very lame excuses for why so many pious people would be murdered. But real quick, it says, <clears throat> the founder of this doctrine claims powers which belong only to Elohim, and his priests pretend to cleanse and save people's souls, as foretold by Kadoshi McIsaac, while they themselves are lying in the mire, also that he should trouble the assembly with great persecutions. But prosperous is he who endures to the end. As the leaves fall from the trees of the forest, so shall he fall off. For his reign shall be 1,200 years. When he shall lose his earthly power, and the kings of the earth shall be defiled by him, and shall pass many unrighteous decrees against the set-apart ones of Elohim. With this object, kings being used against the people with this object a mighty army invaded a part of france or zephyrath whose people had early received the word of elohim from the waldensians the waldensians were a branch of the caledonians before they were known as that name when they went from troy the remnant that stayed true to our maker survived and left without harm they, let, they went to Creek for a generation and then left when the people wanted them to. The, the remnant did. The survivors were paganized. And this is why you have Hebrew, paganized Hebrews all throughout this place. They kept leaving them and going. But they went from Crete to Sicily. And then they went from Sicily to Gaul, which is France. And when the remnant that stayed there, that wasn't killed, they repented. They became known as the Waldensians, and they early got the belief of the Nazarene from Shaul. It mentions that he went to the, the people in that area and gave them the belief. That's who he was preaching to, but this is where they come from. The, the Waldensians are what you call the, the Valdensian, the Valdensians, the, the ones that were murdered and wiped out during the Dark Ages by Rome. They were persecuted almost to annihilation. But right here you can see, <clears throat> it says, With this object, a mighty army invaded a part of France whose people had early received the word of Elohim from the Waldensians. 
the Nazarene were sorely persecuted, but would rather suffer death than to submit to their unrighteous demands. Many of the Valdensians fled to their kinsmen in Caldonia, Kadoshi Morans, or Morans, uh, uh, Monans, sorry, fled to Fief and built an assembly called Newarp, which is to be seen to this day. He was believed to be the first who introduced a complete copy of the renewed covenant. The, El, the English, Welsh, Irish, and part of the Scots, which are Hebrews, this is the Angles and Saxons, the northern kingdom, Ephraim, if you will, the Welsh, the Welsh were the Cymri, the Cymri are a mix of the original Britons, the original Gaelic peoples that fled there with Brutus, who was a paganized survivor of Troy, grandson of the survivor of Troy, if you will. But um, Caradoc, Constantine, they all came from the original Brits from, Brut, Brut, from that line, okay? They would have been from the house of the Samaritans mixed with the original Britons, sons of Ephraim, sons of Yahuda, right? The Irish, the northern part of Ireland was the, the, the sons of Zara, where Harriman was, where Taitafi went to and intermarried. But the rest of that place was the tribe of Dan, and most of them are Roman Catholic. The reason why it was Protestant for a while is, is if you remember, the Jesuits wanted to take over America, and they, they caused the the potato famine and other disasters to flood America with Roman Catholic Irish immigrants, also Roman Catholic French Canadian immigrants and Roman Catholic Spanish immigrants, every type of Roman Catholic immigrant they could to get into the cities of the country. But um, the Scots were also part of the Scythians or the Northern Kingdom that split off and eventually went to Spain and from there to Ireland and from Ireland into Caledonia, where they intermixed with them and became one people, and they were all called the Scots, or the Scoti, the, the wanderers, if you will. But as you can see, brother, 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 brother against brother, infighting in, with the children, and this is why history played out the way it did, because his word is true, even when we're not. <clears throat> But he says, the English, Welsh, Irish, and part of the Scots becoming jealous of the Caledonians immediately ordered that all that professed the Chaldean Amuna or belief to depart from their territories under the penalty of instant death. They therefore fled before their persecutors to Caledonia. King Donald, fearing an attack, gave them shelter and sent them to the north to a place called the Lowlanders Land or Dale where they were granted land under the jurisdiction of the Earl of Ross and the Robertsons of Dunburn, or Dunrobin. They became a brave and worthy people, true to the cause of their religion. The set-apart ones preached everywhere against the desolation and abominations which were like to come upon them. Holland, being mostly peopled by Nazarene slaves from Yarushalayim, suffered much from these persecutions, but still continued in the belief. And it goes on, because it's a literal history of the people. So it was talking about the times, this is after uh, the Middle Ages are already well into commencing. So it would have been after 400 AD, where the Angles and Saxons came in, right? All of these peoples are their own distinct groups. But um, it, I'm trying to help you get a little bit of time for where this is talking about. In this foretelling to begin with, it covered history from the advent of the error all the way down into more modern times. And then you can see that they were actually living out part of its fulfillment when it began at that time. So, uh, Father Willing, with the different enlightened things that we have about what Edom represents and these scriptures that you can see, they're all connected. And the ones that we mentioned that I haven't read here, I encourage you to read for yourselves, to look into, share them if you want uh, in the comments when you, if you do that kind of thing. But 
it all ties together and it helps to give the picture of the things that he's literally doing in creation. And this is what the enemy does all he can to hide. Because if you can see these reasonably, like a reasonable mind hearing these things, you can just believe it. And it, it firms up the truth when you can see that it's actually proven. And truth and reason going together is what our Kepha says is required to have firm belief because he who believes easily will also easily yield. So with that, thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful Sabbath and we will see you next week. Shavuotov.